As an artist, I'm curious. Bookbinding appears to be a fun and relaxing process. Is this a profitable skill to acquire? The best way to find out is to get our hands dirty. I will be making these four books, which can be used as sketchbooks or journals, in this walkthrough episode. I'll show you how to fold, stitch, and tie-dye your own book covers from scratch. So whether you're a seasoned bookbinder or new to the craft, follow along as we create four beautiful handmade books. Checking the orientation of the watermark and the purchase code, which is written in pencil on the corner, helps me determine which side is the right side of my paper. There is only a slight textural difference between the front and back, barely noticeable, but this attention to detail provides quality. I want to ensure that the page spreads are all facing the same way as I bind them together. I am in love with this 100% cotton archival paper, and a part of the allure is in its raw edge, so I don't want to cut this away. Each 22 by 30 inch sheet will be divided into 8. I'm only going to ink the sheets for one of the books. Bookend sheets or end papers are the end pages that hold a book's cover to the interior pages. I'm experimenting with two different methods to ink these pages. In this first example, I'm using a blank silk screen to squeegee the ink onto the paper. This method wasted quite a bit of ink and it didn't give me the full coverage that I wanted. I could have added another layer of ink, but this part of the page will be glued to the book cover and it won't be visible anyhow. The second attempt was much cleaner than silk screening. Using a brayer, I rolled the ink onto the paper. My view of the page is unobstructed, so it's easier to get a solid layer, especially along that raw edge. The ability to scrape off the XX ink back into the jar makes for less waste, so overall I prefer this method. Each spread is folded individually. This repetitive motion can start to hurt the fingers because of the thickness of the paper, so using a bone folder prevents friction burns. It also minimizes the transfer of the skin's natural oils, keeping the pages clean and crisp. Bone folders are great not only for creasing folds, but also scoring, pressing, and burnishing. I was a little worried about folding the ink pages. Sometimes scuff marks and scratches are left behind when creasing the page. A good bone folder shouldn't leave behind any visible marks on the paper, and this one passed that test. An awl is used to punch holes in the book signatures, easing the process of threading. Awls come in many shapes and sizes. I like this one in particular because I can use the heel of my palm or the base of my thumb to push through the page. I'm using a cutting mat to measure the holes evenly spaced one inch apart. 
Holding the paper flat and standing directly above my work makes it easy to line up the awl correctly before the punch. I'm only measuring the first signature of the book. This will then be used as a template for the rest of the pages. I could have continued using the same page as a template for the other books as well, but I don't want to overstress the holes in this particular page and compromise the integrity of the bind. I'm using a wax thread and a giant needle, both design or package, specifically for book binding. I unspooled about nine book lengths of thread to use for the binding, for eight signatures plus one for good measure. My kit came with five different needle sizes, so I chose a medium sized one. The thread is stiff because of the wax, which makes it easy to thread the needle. Well, relatively easy. I tied a knot in one end and got started threading the first signature. Leaving the tail outside the fold, I stitched in and out the next hole, repeating until I looped all the way back around to the starting point. Before attaching the second signature, I knotted the thread to its tail to create an anchor for the chain stitch, which will be visible along the spine. I should note a very important tip, which is to keep the signatures flat to the table while sewing and try not to handle them too much. Always be mindful of creasing or damaging the paper during this binding process. For the second signature, the first stitch goes into the fold and comes out the next hole. The thread loops around the stitch from the first signature and goes back into that same hole, creating the first link in the chain. This process is repeated for each hole in the signature. The chain links of the third signature loop around the second signature, fourth to the third, and so on throughout all the signatures within the book. The final stitch is knotted, thereby completing the bind.
I completed all four and did a final page flip through. One of my stitches was loose and it didn't pull through all the way. I'm hoping that this hacked fix it will work out okay, but I won't know until the covers are done. Also, there does seem to be quite a bit of space between the chain stitches, which I think is caused by the thickness of the thread that I use. So we'll see how this fares out. Time for some tie-dye fun. I have never tie-dyed anything, but I've been wanting to do this as a book cover for a long time. I actually bought this little kit over a year ago, and now I can finally crack it open. I found this while I was perusing the Dollar Tree, and on the same shelf was a cloth sample. Perfect. I whipped through a few YouTube videos just to get some ideas and then was off to the races. Since I have a square cut of fabric, I'm going to try my hand at a mandala or snowflake pattern. While the references I watched use Sinu, which is a wax thread, I'm going to be using the rubber bands provided with the kit. I'm fairly certain that the thread I used to bind the text block would also work for the tie-dye, but I'll test that theory in the future, not today. Opening these bottles hurt my poor little hands and of course a pair of pliers would have made the job much easier. I used all three colors, fuchsia yellow and turquoise. I'm curious to see how they blend together. The direction said to wrap it in plastic so I just used the bag that the cloth came in. Now I have to wait for six to eight hours. Hey, my first attempt is pretty good, but I want to see if I can get a little more variation. Plus, I'm curious to see what effects I can create with the bleach. Before I do that though, I'm changing into my painting clothes. I have a medicine dropper dedicated for my watercolor pans, inks, and now bleach application. It looks great. I'm happy with the result. I only let the bleach sit for a few minutes before washing it out and it worked as I had expected it to. Mm, but I want to bring some of that fuchsia into the turquoise circle for a little more visual balance. So I'm going to give this one more go and that should be good.
I like the final result. I think this should make for some interesting book covers. I'm spoiled. My sweetheart fashioned together a book press for me so I can get started on gluing the spine. The book press is 12 inch square and I found some masonite in my collection of canvases which work great as separators for the text blocks. I'm applying Mod Podge with the sponge for this first layer. I hate sponge applicators. I prefer using a paintbrush because I have better control. I also stacked everything too far inset. So for the second and third layers, I pushed everything flush to the book press edge, which made it easier to work with. As I score into the glue to release it from the masonite separators, I'm considering what material to use as a book cover. Ideally, I would like to use a nicely compressed cardboard or illustration board, but I have some foam core on hand and I think I'll give that a try. There's only one problem though. The foam core I have is black and can be easily seen through the tie-dye cloth. So I need to run to the dollar store and pick up a white one. To the rabbit mobile. Foam core is too thick. It's difficult to cut through on a perfect 90 degree angle while freehanding it with a utility knife. It was a thought to remove one side of the foam core, so one side is cushy while the other is straight cut, but that's far too involved for this particular project. For the first book, I cut the four corners, and I did a pretty lousy job at it. I know that there are several methods for folding corners, and cutting it like this requires a little more perfection and patience than I have. For the second book, I thought to fold the corners in without cutting into the fabric, and this worked out okay. I mean, it looks cleaner than cutting it, but I'm not entirely sold on how this looks. For the third and fourth books, I chose to do a very straightforward corner fold. I used a single cut and the fold lines up with the edge of the book. Of all of these methods, I like the way this one looks the best and it's the easiest.
Once the books had dried, it was time to test the durability. It's okay. Um, the spine measurements need more attention than I gave it credit for, though. The thickness of the foam makes it tough for the book to lay flat open. It's strong, mind you. It doesn't feel like it's going to break when I force fold it open, but my goal is to have a nice cover that lays flat while drawing or writing in the book. Overall, the cloth is very thin and the glue oozes through the weave. I went through a lot of glue. To make these books, I used about three quarters of the bottle of Mod Podge. That's a lot of glue for four little sketchbooks. The smell of the glue is a bit overwhelming as well. Guess what I found at the dollar store when I bought the foam core? These rolls of metallic adhesive film might make for a great book cover and could solve my issue with using too much glue. Tell me, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs>